Well, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today, and I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, mark your place there, and then turn to James chapter 4. So Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be studying, uh, but we're going to start in James chapter 4. Uh, and as I said, we're going to be taking a biblical look at unity. We're going to be looking at what unity is biblically, what unity isn't, and how we can value and promote a culture of unity as the body of Christ. Speaking of values, listen, understand, values are critically important to every family, to every church, to every organization, and here's why. Because what we value shapes what we do, and what we do establishes our culture. And understand, the value of unity is so critically important uh, that Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he prayed specifically for unity. Uh, this was at the forefront of his mind as he was going to the cross. And so that makes it very important for us. As he is now the culmination of his entire ministry on earth, everything that Jesus came to do, he is, a, he is about to, uh, to, to put the exclamation point on it. He's about to fulfill his, his ultimate purpose in coming. And the forefront of his mind at that point, as he prayed to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, was specifically for unity. Now, listen to Jesus' words. John 17, verse 21. He prayed, uh, I pray that they will all be one, just as you, Father, and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. And so here at Reliance Church, understand the value of unity is a core value for us. And here's how we articulate that value. We say that at Reliance Church, we value unity, that we are a diverse family that sticks together in a world that's falling apart. And by any measure, our world is falling apart. All you got to do is tune into the news or log into your social media, and you see that the world is coming apart at the seams. This has never been more true than it is right now. There is ugly division everywhere we look. And right now there's division in the church as, as Christians are divided on how we're supposed to respond to the coronavirus issue and to the mandates that are coming down and all. And division is everywhere. Uh, Jesus said that in the last days it would be this way. Here's what Jesus said. He said, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. He said that in Matthew 24, verse 12. And that's a serious problem because Jesus himself has declared that the two most important commandments, he was asked the question, what's the most important commandment in the law? And his response was to, to say what the most important commandment was, but then he went further and he said, and I'll tell you what the second most important commandment is. He said, um, <clears throat> by this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love one another, John 13, 35, right? And, and so uh, Jesus, when he was asked that question, hey, what's the most important commandment in the law? Here's what he said. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And he said, the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, the entire Bible is summed up by loving God and loving others. This is the defining characteristic of Christianity. All will know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. That's what Jesus said. The psalmist declared this. The psalmist said, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity, the psalmist said, is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Unity is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. In other words, the psalmist is declaring that loving unity is fresh, that loving unity is anointed, and that loving unity is life. 
is life. And, you know, it, 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 it's alive. You know, that's the idea. And with that being said, here's, here's the ugly contrast. How many of you have experienced a church split? How many of us have seen congregations that go through ugly division and they end up just splintering and dividing? And tragically, many of us, if not most of us, have experienced that. And listen, if it's true that loving unity serves as the unique identifier uh, of Jesus' disciples— then why does unity seem to be in such short supply? Why is it that that we have to work so hard to maintain unity? Here's why. Because unity doesn't come naturally to our flesh. Listen to what James said. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He asks the question, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, and so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, and so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, the problem with unity is us. It's the human heart. That's the problem with unity. Because the inherent part of our sin nature is to be self-centered. And listen, understand, that self-centeredness, this isn't learned behavior, it's not environmental behavior, it's an inherent part of who you are as a human being. You've, You've got that flesh nature. Now, if you doubt that, get one toy, get a group of kids, give that one toy to one kid, and you watch their human nature come out. It will be World War III as everybody fights and quarrels over that one toy. And frankly, we see this online right now, where there is just this ugly division that's going on. So what do we need to do? Well, James continues, James 4, verses 7 and 8. He says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, James says, in effect, that division comes when we are divided from God. Let me say that again. Division comes when we are divided from God. Listen, we first have to be unified with Jesus, and then he will enable us to be in unity with one another. We see this in John chapter 21, right? Jesus there, he, he is risen from the grave and he's in the process of restoring uh, the apostle Peter who had denied him. And as he's restoring Peter, Jesus begins to tell Peter how he's going to suffer for the gospel's sake. He's going he's, he's gonna to have to suffer uh, because this is the road that Jesus has prescribed for him. And what does Peter do? Right in the middle of, of the Lord revealing this to him, Peter turns and he looks at John. And now the selfish nature begins to rise in Peter. And he go, and it's, like, it's as if Peter's like, well, I got to suffer. I got to do all that. And what's his question? He says, what about him? What about him? And what did Jesus say to Peter? He basically said, that's none of your business what I'm going to do with him. He said, you follow me. See, that's the key. We, we have to, to make sure, hey, we're following Jesus. So now with that priming our pump, turn now to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesians here, Ephesians chapter 4, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This uh, 
section of, of Ephesians, the, the theme here is how should Christians walk in the church? How, sh- how, should, how should our behavior look like? What's, what's a Christian walk really all about? And we see here in the verses we've just read, in verse 1, uh, Paul tells us that Christians should walk worthy of their calling. And then in the next verses, the next five verses, verses 2 through 6, he says that Christians should walk in loving unity. So we're to walk worthy of our calling, and we are to walk in loving unity. Now, when he says that Christians in in verse 1 should walk worthy of their calling, that word worthy, you might think that it has to do with, you know, something that we have to do worthy. I got to I got to keep up my end of the bargain, right? And and you might think that that's kind of the idea here. That's not it at all. You see, the apostle Paul leading up to chapter 4, he spent the first 3 chapters spelling out in great detail all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, freely by his grace. And so what Paul is now emphasizing here, having established everything that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, what he emphasizes here, that in light of everything that Jesus has done for us, it should motivate us to walk responsively to what God already has done through the person and the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. So what we're being called to is to respond to to the Lord and to respond in loving unity. This is the idea. Paul said something very similar to the Philippians. Uh, In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit... If any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Paul uses the, the word if here four times, but he uses it in a rhetorical sense. He, he says, if there's any consolation, if there's any comfort of love, if uh, there's fellowship in the Spirit, if there's affection and mercy— um, he's, he's saying this rhetorically. It's like saying, if water is wet, or if rocks are hard, right? Or if fire is hot. That's the idea. The point being, of course it is, right? And so what Paul is saying is that because we have consolation in Christ, because we have the comfort of his love, because we have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, because we have the affection and the mercy of God extended to us through Jesus Christ, while we didn't deserve it, by the way, because we have received these things in Jesus Christ, we now have the responsibility to extend that to others. Let's answer the question, what exactly is unity And how do we achieve it? The dictionary defines unity this way. It says that unity is the state of being united or joined together as a whole. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul uses the example of our physical bodies to describe how this works in the church. Here's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 18 through 21. He says, Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would it be if it had only one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet that I don't need you. This is the idea here. And so unity then in the church is when we function interdependently. Just like a body, understanding the value and the contribution of every part of the body and welcoming that. Now, this leads us to the question, how do we attain unity? How do we attain it? Well, Paul gives us a list. If you look here in our text, Ephesians 4, there in verse 2, he tells us that we are to walk with lowliness. The idea is humility, right? He tells us that we are to walk with gentleness. He says that we are to walk with long suffering. And then he adds this. He says that we are to walk with long suffering, bearing with one another. That phrase, bearing with one another, literally in the Greek, what it means is to hold up against something. You have to hold up against something. And here's the idea. The idea is that you're holding up against the inevitable irritants that come 
through relationship with other people. We get this, right? I mean, good grief. We have been under lockdown for a couple of months, right, with our spouses, and what happens when you spend such incredible time together, right? Brenda and I, we, we have been married a very long time, right? And, and, and we've been, you know, under lockdown. And, and let me just tell you, I've always said that if, if you know, you ask the question, where, you know, if you had to be stranded on a desert island, who would you want to be stranded with? And, and without a doubt, without a hesitation, I say, my wife. She says, hey, you know, who do you, you want to go to hang out with anybody? I'm like, no, I want to hang out with you. Let's just hang out together. Now, I can tell you, that hasn't changed a bit. I mean, the lockdown for us being together, um, I mean, it, it's been wonderful to spend this time with, with my wife. But I'll tell you, being together in, in, you know, such close quarters, it certainly brings to the fore those irritants that are, that are inevitable that you're going to have, right? And you have to work through those things. And so <clears throat> this is what we're called to. And I want you to notice that Paul adds that we are to bear with one another in love, in love. And of course, the word that he uses there in the Greek, it's the Greek word agape. And, and uh, you know, if you've been in the church for two minutes, you've probably been instructed on this Greek word agape. The, the Greeks had all kinds of different words uh, for love. There's uh, eros, which, which describes kind of the, 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 uh, the, the sexual intimate part of a loving relationship. And phileo, which is uh, a brotherly love, and, and so on. And then there's this word agape, and it's this very unique word, which basically is an unconditional love. That's the idea of agape love, that, that you, you, it's, a, it's an act of the will. It is a choice that says, I am going to love you. We see this in the Gospels. In, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, agape, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Now, if, if the word agape wasn't used there, if it was a conditional love that, that John was speaking about, and it was John quoting Jesus, these are Jesus' words, God so loved the world, he's speaking himself to Nicodemus at that point. If Jesus had used a different word than unconditional love, if he would, had used a word that meant conditional love, then that sentence would have ended completely differently. It would have been, hey, so God so conditionally loved the world that as soon as they turned on Jesus and nailed him to a cross, he... he Wiped everybody out. Why? Because that kind of love says, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. If you treat me well, I'll treat you well. But that's not what agape means. And that's not what Jesus meant. Jesus said, God loves the world unconditionally. And so because he does, what does God do? He sends Jesus Christ to take our sins upon himself on the cross, dying for our sin in our place. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And having that righteousness of God imputed to us uh, comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And I'll give you the opportunity at the end of the message today that if you don't know that kind of loving relationship with God, you can have that today. If we confess our sins, the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And listen, today, if you are in sin and separated from God, he is one step away. You can repent. The Bible says we are to repent of our sins. And repenting simply means to turn. And what it means is that you acknowledge that you're going in the wrong direction. You acknowledge that Jesus is the right direction. You turn to Jesus by faith. And you say, I confess to you I'm a sinner. I believe that you're the Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins in my place. That you, that you ascended into heaven having been, you know, suffering, died, buried, rose again on the third day. You ascended into heaven that you ever live to pray, to make intercession for the saints there. I believe you're praying for me right now, and I'm turning to you. You can do that today. And so <clears throat> the idea of agape love is that it's, that it's unconditional. And Jesus said agape love is the defining behavioral trait that marks us as Christians. He said, by this, all will know that you 
are my disciples if you have love, agape, unconditional love for one another. Listen, this is not optional. And again, let me remind you of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, that our love for one another and our unity with one another was so important that Jesus, the night he was betrayed, mere hours before going to the cross, this was at the forefront of his thoughts. He says, now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given to me, that, hear it, they may be one as we are one. And so we see that loving unity is of paramount importance to God. And that's exactly what Paul goes on to say in verse 3. Notice there in verse 3 in, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That word endeavoring has to do with we're striving for it. We're working hard for this. This is something we give, uh, we give uh, a, a, an earnest attention to. And he says to keep the unity of the Spirit. That word unity, if you're given to taking notes, you could circle that word. Nearby, you could write one because that's literally what that word unity means. And I want you to notice that in the next couple of verses, this is what Paul emphasizes. <clears throat> Look again at verses four through six. He says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse six, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. The point Paul is making is this, that oneness includes our being one with him and also one with one another. And if you take a walk through the scriptures, you can't get away from a multitude of one another verses to which we are called to. The Bible says we're to be at peace with one another, that we're to love one another, that we are to be devoted to one another, that we are to honor one another, that we are to live in harmony with one another, that we're to accept one another, that we are to instruct one another, that we are to greet one another, have equal concern with one another, we are to serve one another in love. I'm not nearly finished. The Bible goes on. Carry one another's burdens. We're to be patient with one another in love. Hello. Patient with one another in love. We are to be kind and compassionate to one another. We're to forgive one another. We are to encourage one another. We're to admonish one another. We're to bear with one another. We are to submit to one another. We are to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, the Bible says. The Bible says we're to pray for one another, that we're to live in harmony with one another, that we are to offer hospitality to one another. The Bible says that we are to be humble towards one another. These are all these biblical commands with the Lord saying, I want you to be one even as the Father and I are one. The whole Bible summed up, love God and love one another and all men are gonna know that you're my disciples by the love that you have one for another. Church, listen, we gotta take a walk with this. We gotta pray through this because here's the thing, I'm not always that lovable and neither are you. And God help us, we gotta take this to heart and say, man, I am so grateful that God loves me. On my worst day, he loves me. And on your worst day, he loves you. And his expectation is that we would take and receive the love that he has for us and that we would become brokers of it here on the earth, that we would be distributors of his love just as he is freely given to us. Peter summarizes the idea this way. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. Listen, when Peter says, Finally, all of you be of one mind. That phrase, one mind, literally means to think the same thing. 
Writing to the Romans, the Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. We should have that tattooed to us, not to be wise in our own opinion, because that, there's a lot of that going around today. Listen, Paul told the Romans in Romans 15, verses 5 and 6, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, being of one mind, being like-minded, this doesn't mean that you lose your individuality. Right? This doesn't mean that you use your brain or that you lose your brain. It means you lose, use it, but you don't lose it. See, the idea isn't that you can't be yourself. It simply means that you are all in harmony together. And here's the defining point. Don't miss this. It means that you're in harmony together with the Word of God. With the Word of God. When he's exhorting us to think the same thing, the compass heading is we got to all orient our minds and our thoughts and our interactions. It's all got to be predicated and tuned in to the Word of God. Um, We got to put the truth of God's Word first. That's got to be thing that guides us, and that's what's going to result in harmony with one another. We read Jesus's prayer uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. I read it to you a couple of times. Let's back up a few verses. Let's read it together in context. John 17, beginning in verse 17, Jesus praying to the Father, he says this, make them holy, listen to this, by your truth. He says, teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by, listen, your truth. That's the defining word there. Verse 20, he says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. One, we are one and like-minded, and the like-mindedness comes from God's word. That's our compass setting. That's our true north. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, a chorus of voices keep harping the unity tune. What they are saying is people of all beliefs must come together regardless of their beliefs. Such teaching is false. It's reckless and it's dangerous. Truth alone must determine our alignments. Truth comes before unity. Unity without truth is hazardous, our Lord's prayer in John 17 must be read in its full context. Only those sanctified through the word can be one in Christ. To teach otherwise is to betray the gospel. It's been said if you take 100 pianos and you tune them all individually to the same tuning fork, then they will all be automatically tuned to one another. This is the idea. We all have to be tuned to this tuning fork. And then what that will do is it will make us all of one mind and of one accord. And at any point we disagree, we have to come back to the truth of God's word. And that's what's going to put us in harmony. And that is what's going to result in us being unified together. And that's precisely what the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace means. If we all focus on having that same mind, being in tune with Jesus, who modeled lowliness, who modeled gentleness, who modeled long-suffering and forbearance, the natural result is that we are going to be in harmony with Jesus, and then we're going to be in harmony with one another as we model his actions. I close with this quote from Charles Spurgeon again. He says, divisions in churches never begin with those full of love to the Savior. I want to challenge you now as we close in prayer, and I want to invite you now as we close in prayer, just to take a walk with, man, are you divided? Are you experiencing a lack of unity in your life? If you are, I want to invite you to the scriptures. I want to invite you to the scriptures. 
The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree? And listen, what I'm exhorting you to is agreeing with what the Bible says, being a student of the Bible, and then saying, I'm going to submit my life to doing what the Bible says. And, and if we do that, guys, we'll be in harmony together. As I close in prayer, I want to ask you, where do you stand with the Lord? Maybe today you are convicted by the message. Maybe you have surrendered your life to Jesus. You're a child of God. You've got division in your life, and you're, you're not in unity with, with another Christian, with another believer, and maybe you just need to take a walk with, man, I really need to do a real heart check through God's word on this issue, and I need to pray for God to check my math. God, check my heart. Where am I at with your word here? And, and seek that unity that comes from being in tune with God's word. Um, I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, listen, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. It's been said it doesn't matter how far you run from God, he's only one step away, and that step is repentance. I want to invite you today to repent of your sin. And the way you do that, it's not doing good and trying harder. Re repentance doesn't mean you got some work to do to earn the right standing to get back in God's good graces. It doesn't mean that, oh, you've done a bunch of bad things, and so you now got to do a bunch of good things so that God will actually condescend to listen to you. It doesn't mean that at all. Repentance means I have wandered from God. I, I, I have denied the Lord, and, I, and I, I need to be saved. I've made a train wreck out of my life. And listen, God loves you. The Bible makes it clear. God is a God of love. He needs to judge sin. He will judge sin because he's a righteous judge. And so if you make the conscious choice to deny the Lord and to reject the Lord, he doesn't want you to go to hell, but you will be making that choice literally over Jesus' dead body because Jesus came to die for your sins. And he says to you today, I offer to you life. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It comes from repentance, turning from your sin, turning now to God. And if that's you, I want to lead you in this prayer. You can pray something like this. Father, I confess I'm a sinner and I believe, Jesus, that you are the Savior and I am repenting right now in prayer. I'm turning to you. I'm inviting you, Lord, to come into my life and to transform me and to change me. And Lord, I, I want to surrender my life to you. And listen, I just put the pause button on that prayer right now because some of you might be reluctant to pray that prayer. Some of you might be thinking, um, I, you know, I, I don't know that I can give up my sin. Uh, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be this, pray this prayer when, when man, I, I, I don't know if I can give this relationship up. I don't know if I can give these drugs up. I don't know if I can give, you know, this alcohol up. I don't know if I can give up the things that I know are bad and not good for me, but I really love them. My flesh longs for them. I don't know that I can give those things up. The Bible says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You confess that to the Lord. You say, I'm turning to you to save me, and I'm, and I'm asking you to take these desires away from me. I'm asking you to give me new hunger and new thirst for the things of you. I'm asking to know you and to experience the transformation that you promised to bring. And so I'm going to bring all of that junk to you, and I'm going to freely confess, God, I love these things. But, but I know that they're not good for me, and I know that you promised to deliver me from them. Hey, listen, that's an honest prayer. Come to the Lord honestly and say, hey, I, I, I desire to repent and to be made that new creation. I desire you. Lord, I, I want to know you. I want to walk with you. Give me a love for you. Give me a love for your word. And so if that's you, just pray right now, Lord, that's me, and, I, and I'm, I'm confessing all of that but I want to know you and I want to be changed as you promise in your word that I will be if I will repent and turn to you. And so Lord, I do that now and I do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.